Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci-Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today, we're here with Dee Jordan. Dee, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your research? Yes. Um, well, one, thanks for having me, guys. I'm Dee Jordan, a dual doctoral candidate in geography, environment, and spatial science and environmental science and policy. And I study neglected tropical diseases that are vector-borne in sub-Saharan Africa, specifically African sleeping sickness. Thanks for joining us, Dee. Can you define what a vector is for our audience? Vectors are insects. And specifically with regards to the health and well-being of humans and animals, vectors spread disease. It would be akin to a mosquito in the U.S. coast that spreads the Zika virus or West Nile virus. With me, the study of vectors in sub-Saharan Africa, looking at the neglected tropical diseases, I don't focus on the mosquitoes. I focus on a fly. My fly has been around for a very long time. It has some prehistoric features that let us know it's been around for quite some time. It's called the Setsi fly. That's T-S-E-T-S-E. Is there a specific vector illness that the Setsi fly carries? Yes. The Setsi fly carries the parasites which infect people with African sleeping sickness. African sleeping sickness exists in two forms, human African trypanosomiasis in humans and Nagana in animals. African sleeping sickness is a very complex disease system, and it has multiple Setsi fly species which spread the disease, and it also has multiple disease pathways. So one pathway is human fly human, and another pathway is animal fly human. What happens when we have the multiple disease pathways means the disease expressed in different ways, meaning there are two versions or two strains of African sleeping sickness. There's the West African sleeping sickness and the East African sleeping sickness. What is the difference between the two different strains in the first place? So beyond the most common thing, the geography, one being on the East and one being on the West, is how the disease manifests in humans and animals. So with West African sleeping sickness, the disease is the chronic form, meaning after a setsi fly bites a human and transmits the trypanosomes that infect the human and, and move through the bloodstream of the human, it could take two years for the human to become symptomatic and or die from the disease. Death comes when the disease is left untreated. The pathway for the West African disease in the human is you get bit by the fly, the fly drops the parasites, which cause the infection through its saliva glands. And those parasites get into the bloodstream of the human. And once it crosses the blood brain barrier, the person becomes asymptomatic and they become lethargic. They could have fevers. Initially, it looks like malaria and it's often misdiagnosed. But after a prolonged time with the illness and when the antimalarials don't work, they recognize that it may in fact be African sleeping sickness. Now, similarly, the East African strain, it's derived from animals. So it starts in the bush with wild animals. If a setsi fly bites a wild animal and takes up the trypanosomes from the wild animal, it goes through a synthesis in the gut of the setsi fly. So when it bites a human, it transmits those trypanosomes to the human. The big difference here is that the zoonotically derived African sleeping sickness strain is stronger. And in humans, the disease goes right through us. It takes about six months. So the manifestation of the symptoms is very rapid, and death is also within six months. And to clarify for our audience, the parasite that you're referring to, its scientific name is the trypanosomes, right? Absolutely. The trypanosomes, um, it, they are named by those people who discover them. So the East African trypanosomes are trypanosome brucei because Dr. Bruce discovered those trypanosomes in the zoonotic uh, strain of sleeping sickness. And in West Africa, they have several other trypanosomes, but they all lead to an infection that is um, poorly understood to some degree that has no vaccine 
and that leaves 60 million Africans at risk of the disease every year. Okay, Dee, can you please help me understand this? Is it the sleeping disease only within Africa, or is it also like over here in America? African sleeping sickness is endemic to 36 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The Setsi fly itself, the vector of the disease, is geographically constrained. It's a creature of habit, for lack of a better term. It doesn't like areas that are too cold. It needs a very specific soil moisture and humidity level, and it needs a certain temperature range, so around a constant 65 to 82 degrees at all times. And therefore, even in the continent of Africa, you won't find setsies everywhere. But within the 36 countries that form like a unified setsy belt, you will find them pretty um, present in the remote rural areas of sub-Saharan Africa. What part of the Setsi virus trans vector transmission were you interested in studying anyways? So in order to answer that question, I have to tell you a little story. Is that okay? When I was nine, my uncle, who was a sanitation worker in Memphis, he um, saw some books on the sidewalk and he asked the homeowners if it was okay, instead of throwing the books away, if he could give those books to his niece. And they agreed. They thought it was a great idea that the, the books would have another life cycle. Well, one of the books was about tropical diseases. And I didn't know what the tropics were at that time. And reading it, you know, your mind conjures the beach, right? The beach. And, but it was about diseases. And I was curious. And I read about Africa, which was one of those places I, I fantasized and you know, would daydream about what those landscapes look like, especially being American and hearing stories of what's there. I wanted to ensure myself an opportunity to read and, and synthesize that information about Africa. So I was drawn to the chapter about African river blindness and African sleeping sickness. And my nine-year-old self didn't think that sleeping, like sleeping, my mom makes me take naps, so <laughs> sleeping can't be a bad thing, right? Well, I learned a lot different when I was nine that this fly that I thought had a cute, cute name, T-S-E-T-S-E, -S -E, Setsy, and although I called him Titsy because, well, that sounds more fabulous than Setsy, but um, scientifically it's the Setsy, it would bite humans and animals and it would cause them to have to limit their capacities in their everyday functioning, meaning they couldn't get up to harvest or to fetch water, to take care, moms couldn't take care of their kids because the disease would decimate them and make them lethargic and they wouldn't eat, so they would waste away. And treatment and treatment facilities were far away from a number of villages. And when I was reading this, you know, it struck some things in me as a nine-year-old Fast forward to getting my PhD, and I was asked, what would you like to do? You know, there are times when your research and your interests align really neatly, and this was one of those moments. For me, I remember the first day my advisor asked about what I wanted to study because we have a whole vector lab. So it was, most people study mosquitoes, and I said, oh, I have to study the Setsi fly. That's like a throwback to my uncle, and it makes my life kind of full circle. But I didn't just want to study the traditional epidemiology of this disease. Why don't you want to study the epidemiology of this disease? I'm, a, I'm an activist here at MSU and an advocate, and I'm all about how we empower people to help themselves. So I took the exact same angle with my research. How does an activist approach differ from one that you typically would see in a lab, like a genetics approach? So as opposed to looking at the ways in which genetics can remove the, the viral nature of the fly or how it changes the trypanosomes into an infectious agent or how we could uh, 
uh, create a vaccine or remove some things to, to make the fly less harmful, I said, well, why don't I look at how we can lead people to save their own lives? It's interesting that you're taking a not-so-typical approach, but a way that can help save money while empowering people. How can you lead people to save their own lives? What approach do you look at? Um, so I look specifically at a risk reduction approach to set the trypanosomiasis control. What I want to do is find ways in which we can change the daily movement of people. One, understand them, understand risk areas and where people come into contact or potentially come into contact of exposure to the fly and change mildly those things. After you've understood the patterns of the Setsi fly and the living patterns of the people who inhabit the same space as the fly, what are ways that you can analyze and change the daily movement of the people? From a culturally sensitive approach, asking them first and foremost, how do you do the things you do every day if it's impacting your daily subsistence? And I'm saying things like minor modifications. If a mom is fetching water with her child on her back after she's given birth, and that's what she has to do every day for her family to survive, then how do we adjust that? Because if she's moving at the same time, the fly is the most active, then maybe we adjust the times in which she moves. If we learn enough about the fly and its habits, it likes to go to work the same time we do, from 8 to 5. So as opposed to fetching water in areas where it's humid, where it's dry enough to support the life of the fly in that activity, why don't we have people go and collect water later in the day where they're less likely to come into contact with the fly? And that's a low-tech intervention, and I get that low-tech isn't always the most popular, but giving a mother the chance to save her own life, empowering her to do so, is a huge step in the right direction. How does risk reduction change from region to region in the African continent, considering how it's composed of so many different climates? That is an outstanding question because one of the things that I look at is efficacy. Efficacy of SETSI control programs in their current form because there is difference in how people approach the disease from the West and how they approach it from the east to how the people in the south approach the disease. And there's no unified methodology. I've gone to a number of the countries, and I've watched the protocols from start to finish. I've participated in a number of the field assignments and the research and the methods that they use to try to control the disease. And I find myself in awe that it's not as unified. And so I'm hoping that some Insights that I will give in my dissertation would be just that, how we can control across space and time uniformly. Do you happen to have a proposed method or way that you think would provide good insights for people that are trying to intervene and control the disease? So one of the things I'm proposing is the CANVAS method. It's the controlled application to neutralize vectors across space. It's a model in which it takes into consideration our, our border connections with other people. So if my household is doing one thing and the other household is not, the Setsi fly, like most modern vectors and insects, it likes to go where nothing's being done and wait out the infection control or the insecticide control or whatever control method we're using at one place, it likes to wait that out and come back. So I say that the Setsi fly is probably one of the most intelligent vectors in the world, and the parasite is uh, probably one of the most intelligent in the world. What makes the vector and the parasite so intelligent? Because what they do together, they're extremely lethal when they're connected together. The Trypanosome changes its protein sheet really quickly, so we can't create a vaccine because we can't get ahead of it in order to create a vaccine, so it's really smart. And the fly is a great reinvader. It instinctively knows when pesticides or some type of uh, control measure is being enacted to knock down the population. It goes away, and it comes back. And it can go away for as long as 10 years, and then suddenly you have a new birth of a number of the flies 
wow, so people think that the flies are gone, but it's easy for them to make a comeback, it seems. How is this reinvasion prevention important within your project, or how can we bring down this reinvasion? So what we're trying to do is break that cycle. And the, the reason why reinvasion is an important um, aspect of this conversation is because if everyone isn't doing everything together, uniformly, across space, we can't make the environment inhospitable for SETSI, and therefore the populations flourish. And in order to eradicate it, we first have to knock down the population to reasonable numbers so that eradication measures such as the sterile insect technique can be effective. So there are different severities of the African sleeping sickness from the eastern to the western coast of the sub-Saharan Africa. For example, you were saying that it can affect people within six months versus within two years. So I would assume that different regions would be dealing with this and trying to prevent it and maybe take the severity of it um, lightly or even more seriously in certain areas. Since you said that you've been to some of these regions, do you see the difference with how the community tries to deal with this and prevent this um, African sleeping sickness and things like that? Yes, actually. So with African sleeping sickness, because it's a global public health concern, the policies that are shaped for it are drafted by the World Health Organization. And so it's very heavily top-down, written by World Health, and then administered through local and regional agencies. The community typically are not involved in the policy piece and only peripherally are involved in the actual controls. How is this controlled through the World Health Organization in different regions, and what methods do they use to try and control the reinvasion and number of setsi flies? With control efforts, the difference in how they're approaching control in East Africa versus how they're controlling the the fly in West Africa, would be in West Africa, they're using, in Senegal specifically, they're using the sterile insect technique. Now, the sterile insect technique is a control measure that means first we go out into the field and we deploy a number of traps that catch and kill traps throughout the Senegal countryside. Once we get the numbers down to an area that's reasonable where we can actually go in with the eradication method, we then deploy sterilized males that have been nuclear irradiated in facilities in Burkina Faso or Slovakia. That's a technique that was learned from the International Atomic Energy Agency, has been supported by the IAEA as well as the Americas. And we take the irradiated flies up in gyrocopters or helicopters and we release them throughout the area. What happens then is that they compete to mate with the female wild fly who can only mate once in her lifetime. Thanks for the overview of what happens in West Africa, where the setsi fly carrying the African sleeping sickness is more severe. What happens in East Africa, where it is less severe? How do they take control measures there? When we look at... East Africa, where there is this zoonotic strain of African sleeping sickness, they're using more of the traditional bait and trap methods where they put um, odor bait or insect odors onto baits so the flies are attracted to the traps and they catch the flies and kill them in the traps. Now that's a slower method, but when you consider that Sterile insect technique is way more expensive than the lower tech trap method. And most countries in Africa are poor. It makes sense for them. But this is what I see as driving the effectiveness level. So if we have Senegal doing sterile insect technique, and while they can rightfully have the fly eradicated within five years, if their border partners aren't doing the same thing, then we're left with the same problem. Um, Likewise, if they're not doing the same thing in other parts of the African continent, like in West Africa, I mean, I'm sorry, in East Africa, then we still have the problem with the fly. Have you investigated on what it would look like if the community was involved with the decision-making process in regards to this vector-borne disease? 
Absolutely. So um, as I stated previously, I'm an activist and an advocate. And one of the things that I advocate for both uh, in my research always, as well as uh, in my student life here at MSU, is the reduction of marginalized voices, meaning I want people who historically haven't had a voice to have one and to share their truth, especially when it impacts their lived experience, because they're all different, right? And knowledge is very situated. I found in my, over the summer, I went to Senegal, Zanzibar, and Tanzania, and I found in my interviews with community members, information that has been largely left out of the tale of the Setsi fly and how it's impacted the, the African lived experience. There are things that we didn't consider. For instance, it's assumed if we get rid of the fly, that development would boom and that suddenly that's going to lead to poverty alleviation. However, when I spoke with farmers, they said not so fast. Development is happening all around our farms so that when you remove these flies, our intensification can't change because industry has bought up all the land surrounding my farm. That wasn't as a perspective that I've read in any of the historical documents, any published literature. So I immediately text my advisor because I was like, oh, my goodness, we might have just landed on something. This is not a perspective that is talked about. And we need to be the ones to make sure that those voices are heard from in very real ways. It's very important to get the opinions and knowledge of the people who live there to help inform the policymakers that lead them. What do you do to capture these voices to help disseminate their insight about how to alleviate poverty? So what I do to capture those voices and to be sure that the people who are most impacted by control have the lion's stake in the control. Currently, policies are, again, top-down, right? They're written from people who are far removed from the communities that those policies would impact on in any real way. Well, I wanted to write policies that are bottom-up and talk directly to the people who are affected. How do you capture these voices and directly connect the people that are affected by the control of the Setsi fly to the politicians? Who do you talk to when you are conducting these interviews? So I do something called the political, environmental, social, and technological matrix. I go out, I interview people, and I ask them questions that are under those four blocks. And I only talk to the stakeholders. For me, I define stakeholders as the people whose lived experience are affected by this disease and this fly every single day. The information that I've received from them, the quality of the interviews, was top notch. So the notion of expertedness goes out the window because I talked to the experts who were the farmers and the children who were playing, the the school teachers and the drivers and the, the pastoralists who are moving their cows around, the moms who are fetching water and and tilling the fields every single day. Have you had the opportunity to take these different things that you've learned throughout this research experience to politicians that are working in policies in this field? I also talked to experts across multiple scales. So I didn't just want to limit it to just the community. I wanted to hear what the community had to say, but I also want to juxtapose it to what the people who are in elected leadership had to say. And I also wanted to know what the World Health Organization had to say, because quite frankly, 100 years of research on Setsi and trypanosomiasis, and we've not gotten closer to closing the door on this disease, I find horrifying. And so therefore my research and my dissertation is an indictment on exactly why the World Health hasn't assured us a conclusion to this disease in sub-Saharan Africa. I think it's wonderful that you were able to get there and talk to the people of the community versus just the policymakers. I think it's really, really important to see how does this actually affect their everyday lives, especially because they're the ones being impacted by it. You had also mentioned that you're an advocate here at Michigan State University. What things have you advocated for over here? Like, um, what things do you do outside of lab over here at MSU? Well... (laughs) <laughs> That's I'm tired already thinking about it, but I'm an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion here at MSU. I've supported our DACA students through um, writing legislation and having it passed through the Council of Graduate Students, where I served as both Vice President of External Affairs and the President. I have um, 
advocated for the Muslim students to reduce the ban, to make MSU a sanctuary school. I want all students who go to MSU to feel like they belong here. I've uh, advocated for, there's no place, MSU is no place for hate. Quite, quite frankly, I don't want to walk around worried that just because of the skin that I'm in, someone wants to target me. It's We have enough pressure as students and we don't need the additional onset of these socialized pressures and these preconceived notions of what brown skin means and what it does. And honestly, if you're here, you deserve to be, and uh, you should be able to thrive. You should be allowed to thrive. I've asked for the trans, um, the unified bathrooms or the bathrooms that are safe spaces for our trans students, because I think that's important. I think our society is changing, right? And we have to change to go along with that. And we need to find more ways to support one another and less ways to tear each other down and to divide, you know, ourselves. I personally want my friend groups to always look like the UN. I need to walk around with a bunch of folks that look like we're in the UN Council every day. Why? Because I know that my life is going to be enhanced by their experiences culturally and socially, and I hope to do the same for all of them. I just think it's quite natural to be supportive of the multicultural building. Equity and inclusion are one some of the things that really add to the experience of a student when they're here at Michigan State University. And I really do thank you for all of your efforts that you've put in during your tenure as a student here at Michigan State. And thank you so much again, D. Jordan, for coming in to talk a little bit about your research and how it's helping affect people all over the world. Thank you. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on Scifiles.